give you a little background. Uh, Norval has already given you some. Uh, earlier this year, I gave a presentation on uh, a technique that we use at Cogent when we're evaluating a client and seeing what the problems are. And a part of that involves ma value stream mapping. And there were a lot of people who we began to realize really didn't know exactly what value stream mapping was. So we decided, okay, let's give a, a real quick presentation today on what is a value stream map, okay? And, and how to put it together, what it does for you. Uh, and then we'll, you can decide what you want to do from there. Um, value stream mapping comes from the lean uh, principles and it's a very uh, powerful technique for uh, identifying, bear with me a minute, okay, for identifying uh, where you have uh, problems in your manufacturing operations and what you can do to fix them. Again, this tells a little bit more about me uh, and about Cogent, what we've been doing over the years. That's a picture of me. Uh, it was taken about 10 years ago, but I'm more or less the same. Um, today's presentation and, and the, the objective of this is not to teach you everything there is to know about value stream mapping, but to explain what it does, okay, and how it's used in lean theory to identify operations for improvements. Uh, you're not going to be able to come out of a one hour presentation and do a value stream mapping uh, map. OK, uh, what I'm trying to do is to explain, OK, here's a tool. Here's how it works. If it's something you are further interested in, then you can go further, either contact us or someone else, another consultant and say, help me to develop a value stream map for my plant. OK, but what I want to do here today is to explain what it is and how it works and, and the benefits that you can get from a value stream map. Uh, and at the end of this presentation, I'm going to, we're going to try and do this in 45 minutes and give you some time to ask questions afterward. Uh, normally, when I sit down with a crowd and talk about this, I ask for a show of hands of who knows about lean manufacturing. Can't do that. So I'm going to go on the assumption that most of you uh, don't know much about lean manufacturing, and I'll give you a quick overview, okay? Lean manufacturing is a philosophy uh, about production and production flow that uh, emphasizes minimizing the amount of resources that are used in the production activities for an organization. Now, this could also be applied to an office, but primarily you see it applied to a manufacturing operation. And uh, one of the things you do in lean manufacturing is to identify those activities uh, in the design, in the procurement, in the production of a product that don't add value. Uh, again, this comes from the Apex Dictionary. Now, to understand value stream mapping and lean, you have to understand what is a value-added activity and what is a non-value-added activity, okay? And here's the definition in front of you real quick. Value-added activity is something that the customer is willing to pay for. And the question you ask yourself when you look at a particular activity on the shop floor is, if I deleted this, would the customer complain? Okay, that's, that's a real quick way to identify whether it's value-added or not. A non-value added act, act, excuse me, a non-value added activity is something that is really is a waste. It consumes resources, and most importantly, it probably consumes time, but doesn't really create value for the customer. Now, let me stop for just a minute. When we talk about a customer, this can be an external customer who gets a bill for his product or for your product, or it can be an internal customer, which would simply be the next department or the next plant that uses your product, okay? But a customer is a customer. It's the guy who's taking your product. Examples of non-value added is making more than you really need, okay? Making it earlier than it's needed or making it faster than it's needed. And we'll talk about these in a little bit more detail later on. The last thing, and, and people forget about this in a lot of, uh, of the lean uh, theory. There is such a thing as a non-value added activity, but it's still necessary. You gotta do it. OK, and those are activities that you have to do uh, to comply with health, safety or some legal requirements. Uh, and I would add even quality. Uh, you may have to have quality activities to make sure that you're making it right. Now, we can get into to how that works later on. As a matter of fact, on our website, if you go to the Cogent website and uh, look over the, uh, the blog uh, topics for the last 
couple of months, uh, I wrote a, a, a short essay about quality as a non-value added activity, but it's still necessary. And you might want to refer to that uh, for, for your interest. Moving on. And again, the blog post is on April 26th of this year. And that came as a result of a discussion from my earlier presentation. Okay, the question is, okay, we've talked about value added, non-value added. How do you know what it is? Okay, and you have to, to, to answer that question, you look at the flow of materials and the, and, and the flow of information that's needed to make a product in your value stream. Now, some more definitions. Okay, what is a value stream? A value stream is all the activities, both those that add value and those that don't, that are required to, to take a product from raw material to finished product that's in the hands of the customer. Okay, the map, the value stream map, is a simply a visual representation of all of these activities from beginning to end. And on this map, you will identify the people, the material, and the information that's needed, that flows through the value stream to make the product. And you depict the detailed steps in, this, in each work center. Okay, the purpose of a value stream map, pure and simple, is to document what you're doing today. And you're gonna do it for future reference. You want a visual picture, all right, of the entire value stream, not simply a single process, but the entire value stream and how all these different processes are connected. You want to look at the material flow. You want to look at the information flow. What information are you getting from either from the customer or from other uh, departments in your company that cause you to take actions? All right. Uh, the, the map will give you a blueprint that will enable you to identify where you want to make improvements. And you're going to be uh, using lean concepts and lean techniques, okay, to improve that value stream process flow. Uh, it, the, the map will give you an opportunity to develop what's called a future state, which is an improved version of what you just, uh, you're doing today. And it gives you, uh, the, the current state will give you a reference and a framework for implementing changes to go on to the future state. Okay, this is an iterative process. If you look at the top of this diagram, step one, you do a current state value stream map, which simply says, this is how we're operating today. Okay, then you look at step two, you say, how do we want to improve this? What non-value added activities can we eliminate? How can we speed up the flow of materials through the, through the value stream? That's your future state. As a result of getting from step one to step two, step two, you will have to have what we call Kaizen events. A lot of Japanese in this whole process. A Kaizen event is a change, a particular thing that's going to get changed. Either it's changing machinery, changing flow, changing, it could be as, as, as much as changing uh, uh, the relationship of machinery on the shop floor, uh, layouts, things of that nature. And each of those events, okay, are what's needed to go from the current state to your future state. You identify the Kaizen events, and then as after you've implemented all those, then you have a new value stream and you start the process again. Uh, typically, uh, going from the current state to the future state is not necessarily something you do once. All right? You don't say a future state and say, hey, look, now we're going we're gonna to make all these gigantic improvements and then go to a future state. Typically, you're going to be making uh, relatively short, small changes. Uh, all of them will benefit you. You'll, get, you'll see progress. You'll see improvement as a result of each one, but you're not going to completely change the entire shop floor in one fell swoop you're going to be making changes and working toward your ultimate future state. Okay, but this, again, this is an iterative process. You're constantly doing this, and it, the total, total operation may take up to, to two years, could take even longer. The point is, every time you make a change, you're going to see improvements in the operation that you can, you can measure. Okay, one term you wanna remember in this 
is a term called tack time. And there's an equation down there for it, real simple. Okay, uh, it's the effective working time and it's divided by the customer requirements. So if you have 27,000 seconds there in a, in a particular shift operation, you have to make 460 pieces, you have 59 seconds to make each piece to get it out in time. And if each, each step in the process, in the value stream, completes its, its work in 59 seconds, then everybody's in sync and you're okay. We'll get into that a little bit more as we get down there. Now, the question is, how do you determine a value stream? It is not necessarily a production line, okay? And basically what it is, it's simply those products that share resource, production resources. Now, here's a real simple table, and I would strongly recommend you start off with this table before you do anything else. This was a sample we used for an exercise uh, a number of years ago. Across the top, you have the process steps, spot welding, flash removal, painting, manual assembly, fixtures, electronic tests, so on. And then on the uh, vertical axis, you have the particular products that you're making or sub-assemblies. And you'll notice the left-hand steering bracket and the right-hand steering bracket use all of the same process steps. They make a different part, and those parts are not interchangeable. Left and right don't work together, okay? You have to have one for each, each uh, final assembly, but you, a left can't be substituted for a right and vice versa, but they each use the same process steps. And those two parts, those two products, would be in the same value stream. And those four process steps would be a value stream, different from the other three that you see down there, which use some of the same steps, but not enough of them to justify being in that same value stream. So what I have is the left and right steering bracket in one value stream. Now, the seat rail, the bumper brackets use spot welding and they use manual assembly, all right, but they don't use the other steps in the first value stream, so they might be considered another value stream altogether. So we've identified a value stream. Again, not necessarily a production line for an individual part, but resources that make uh, several different parts. One important, I put, a, I put a star down here because this is really, really in, important, okay? When, and I've seen this happen over and over and over again in a wide variety of process operations, okay? The lead time and the processing time. The lead time is the time it takes for to make one piece all the way through the, the value stream from the time you introduce the raw material to the time you have a finished part. And that's in, cal in calendar days, basically. The process time is the actual time that the product is being worked on at a machine or at a work center. Process time is always less than lead time. In some cases, in most cases, actually, process time is significantly less than lead time. And this becomes a really rude awakening when you're doing your value stream map that your process time can be, you know, less than 20%. In some cases, it's only 5% of the total lead time. I had a situation with a plant I was working with, and I said, you know, how long does it take to make a product? They said, oh, it takes about four weeks. I said, okay, you're telling me you have 160 hours involved in this. And they said, oh, no, we only have eight hours of, of actual labor time. Okay, the question is, if you can make one in eight hours, why is it there for four weeks? Looking at your current state map, you're going to be recording a lot of data, okay? And we'll talk about how to get this data in just a minute. All right, the data points you want to look at for, for uh, an operation are the process time, the changeover time, the number of particular workers you might have on each shift, inventory levels, and I'm not talking so much about accounting inventory. I'm talking about what do you have stored in front of a, of a machine, what do you have stored after a machine, okay? Uh, looking at scrap and rework, looking at your QC operations, 
and overall the material flow. Where does it come from when it goes to the to the particular machine or the work center? Where does it go when it leaves it? All right. The information flow are basically orders from a customer that justify making the product and production orders that may come from a production control department uh, that say, now's the time to do this particular thing. Now, you decide, okay, we're going to do a value stream map. We're going to go out to the production floor. I'm going to get our team together and we're going to get started. Okay. Uh, first thing you want to do is to review real quickly with your, your, uh, your mapping team, what are the basic steps we're looking at? And if can we calculate attack time right now? If you can't, don't worry about it. Okay. But what are the basic processing steps? Then you look at what starts my production process. A customer order, an order from production control to make something for inventory, whatever it is, what information causes me to start work? Now, you've got that information flow, and as a result of that starting work, material has to start flowing, and you want to document that. And as you're going through each step in the process or in the value stream, you're identifying the lead time and the processing time. Now, value stream mapping doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be laborious. Uh, I've been able to do plants that, that have can make up to a, a hundred uh, hundred million dollars worth of sales in a year. Been able to do a value stream map in three days with a team. Okay, and that's one of the beauties of value stream mapping. It doesn't take a long time to put a map together. You could do it in a relatively short period of time. If it takes you longer than a week, I'd say maybe you're you've got too big a uh, uh, you got either got to have your your value stream wrong or you're you're getting uh, sidetracked. But you want to identify everything that's going on. And one of the best ways to collect the information, go out on the production floor and talk to the operators. Explain to them this is what I'm doing. I'm trying to figure out what's going on. Help me. What's happening in your work center? What problems do you see? Where do you store your inventory? Uh, when, when is QC done? How often do you have rework? And most operators, particularly if you're using a team from inside the company, most operators will be pretty forthright. And they'll tell you what's going on. They, they have problems, and they don't like those problems. They'll tell you what they are. OK, great. Take your notes. OK? Uh, you don't have to use a stopwatch in a lot of cases. Uh, you just need to collect the data, and uh, you can get away with, with just getting estimates from shop floor operators, which will be surprisingly accurate as you go through this. Now, you get your team together, you look at your notes, you look at your drawings, and you start making your map. And one of the things, most important things you want to look at is, okay, what's the lead time for this product, and what's my processing time? Now, you're going to finish your current state map, and you're going to have to present it to somebody so you can get some changes made. And typically, you wind up presenting it to management who may or may not completely understand lean theory and may not be quite sure, may not have ever done a value stream map and not know exactly what's going on. But this visual representation will make it fairly quick for them to, to catch on to. You're going to start off with, this is what the customer tells me. And this is what I tell myself to make this thing start. And then you start showing the lead time and the process time at each step, and you identify the problems. Look, I've got a push operation here. I've got some wait time here. I've got an extended setup issue, more rework than I know what to do with, and I'm making too much at this one work center. And from that, you're going to have some, present, you know, some recommendations for management. Okay. And I don't go into details about right now about the symbols, but there are symbols for a lot of these things that you're going to be putting on your map. That's for discussion later on as you get into training a team for value stream mapping. But you're going to be looking at, uh, again, information flow, production flow, uh, various Kanbans if you have them, and, and, and how you're doing scheduling. Your operation symbols that you do want to identify, again, what is the process step? Who's the customer of that process step, and, and uh, where does the material come from? And data for each work center. Again, how long does it take to set up? How long does it take to process a product? How many workers do you have? What kind of machinery do you have? 
things of that nature. Your inventory, where do they store this stuff before they work on it? What do they do with it when they're finished? Uh, how do they make shipments to the next area? Is this a push operation or is it a pull operation? Okay. All of these symbols, again, are going to be on your map. And it, right at this, at this point in time, this is not a good time to talk about symbols, but there are already developed symbols that will help you put your map together. This is a value stream map, real quick. Uh, at the top, you see the production control organization, and uh, they get an order from the distribution center, and they send orders to suppliers, and they send a schedule out to each of the different areas. Uh, this this turns out to be, I believe it's a it's a uh, uh, an upholstery line, a furniture line, and uh, you have various uh, work centers there. You have a fabric cut work center, sewing, upholstery, final assembly, and then shipping. Okay, and you also have in conjunction with that assembling the frame, cutting the foam, putting the foam on the frame, and then fitting it, sending it on to the upholstery area. Uh, the di the uh, triangles here with the eyes in them are inventory points, okay? And you see, uh, if you can see my, my pointer there, on this first one it says two weeks. You have two weeks worth of inventory in, in front of fabric cutting. And after fabric cutting, you have one day's worth of inventory. And after sewing, you have three days worth of inventory. And uh, after upholstery, you have one and a half days worth of, of inventory. And then after final assembly, you have three days before it even gets shipped out. Now, looking down at the bottom here, some people call this a cam chart. I call it a sawtooth, for lack of a better term. This is where you, you visually show the lead time and the processing time. The lead time for this operation, if you go through and look at it, okay, is 27 and a half days, okay? And these aren't to scale. It doesn't have to be. The upper, the upper lines on this sawtooth are the lead times. The lower times are the processing times. And this is the fun part where management usually chokes a little bit. Your lead time is 27 and a half days. The processing time, the time that material is actually being worked on, is less than an hour. And again, you have to go back and ask yourself, what is this stuff doing out there for, you know, over 26 days, for Pete's sake? Okay, and that's costing you money. Supposing your lead time was only 13 days. What does that do to your volume out of the plant? Even if I haven't changed my processing time, all right, if I cut my lead time in half, I've just doubled my volume out of the plant. Trust me, that hits the bottom line, and management gets real excited about that. This is probably one of the most, and I put a star on this slide, one of the most important things you want to show on your value stream map is the lead time versus the processing time in your value stream. The lead time is shown on one level. The processing time is shown on another level. It doesn't matter once, whether one's on the top or the bottom. The point is you want to have those times documented, okay? So when management sits in that meeting and gasps at the difference, you can say, yep, and these times are pretty right, okay? Even if your processing time is off by 100%, okay? Again, you got 27 and a half days of lead time, and you got two hours worth of processing time, and that's still something that says, we've got a problem, we need to fix it. This is, I found this is probably one of the most powerful tools to, to get resources from management to fix the issues. Okay, now, you got your, your, your current state map. Management has agreed, yeah, that's a pretty accurate map, and we're, we've got to do something. We've got to do a future state map. What do we want to do? What are the easy things we can take care of? Okay. You start with your future state map and you start looking at what's going on. How do I get rid of, for example, the inventory between process steps? And there's a whole lot of lean techniques to do this. I'm not, when this, is, this is not the time to get in all the different lean techniques. But in the lean concepts, you're going to have ways to get rid of your inventory, to speed up your, 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 uh, your lead times, and to get everything in sync. And you're going to calculate a tack time of what you want 
this future state to do? What is going to be the pacemaker? What, what step in the whole process is going to determine how fast you can get something out the door? And are you going to have to build only build to order? Or are in some stages, are you going to be building to a supermarket, which is then drawn down by the next work center? Are you, how are you going to uh, improve your flow? Do you want to have a pull flow? Do you want to have a push flow? And in the end, these lean techniques will help you to reduce your lead time. Here's really quick, just some of the icons that go into a future state value stream map. And we're not going to get any details on this because I want to give you some time for, uh, for questions. You can use Kanbans, you can use supermarkets, uh, you can do various different ways to uh, to improve your production flow. This is an example of a future state map, uh, and again, you've seen down here. This is not the same. Uh, this is not the same process that we showed earlier on this the uh, the uh, upholstery. This is simply, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's a, sam uh, a stamping operation. But the idea is, all of a sudden now, I have uh, a Kanban card which determines when I pull stuff out of a supermarket here to go to the welding and assembly operation. And when it leaves that, it goes to a supermarket here. All right, and that's just one example. The little stars here, the explosions are Kaizen events that are going to be enacted to make improvements. Okay, we have a current state map we have a future state map, and we have a list of Kaizen events that we want to implement to go from the current state to the future state. Now, you're going to have a lot of opportunities. You're going to have a lot of events. And the question is, which ones do I do first? Like anything else in, in uh, the manufacturing world, you're going to have to make some choices because you don't have enough resources to do everything all at once. All right. So you want to take a look at each Kaizen event and say, if I implement this change, what is it going to give me in terms of either reducing my cost or speeding up my flow? There are going to be some cases in which you're going to say, yeah, I can speed up my flow. Great. The problem is, the next work center can't cope with that. So what's the point? Look at something else. But you're going to make a, a, a list of your Kaizen events. You're going to estimate the costs and the benefits that are going to be involved in implementing each Kaizen event. And you're going to rank them and decide which ones you want to go with first. You're not going to be able to do everything all at once. I promise you, don't worry about that. As you go through the next iteration, these same events will start coming up again, and you'll have opportunities then. You're going to put together for each Kaizen that you've identified that you want to enact. You're going to put together a team. This is not a team of consultants. This is a team of people in the plant. People who know the operation, who know the production workers, who know the shop floor, who know how the material is going to go, and who know what they want to change. Your team is going to be made up of both production people, and you may have some people from the office who are familiar with some of the operations, or, or remotely familiar. And the advantage of having non-production people in your team is they bring a different perspective. Okay, the obvious may not be so uh, so obvious to them, and they're going to ask some hard questions, which you may want to listen to. All right, so you put together. Typically, I, I look at maybe two thirds production and, and, and one third uh, uh, non-production people, okay? They have a single Kaizen event that they are going to work on. They're a single improvement and they're not going to do their normal job. This is not something you do in your spare time. This is something you're relieved of your normal job and you're gonna work on this team to fix this problem, okay? For no longer than a month. If it's longer than a month, Break it down into smaller units. When they're finished, you're going to see, okay, it used to look like this. Now it looks better. And guess what? We have some measurable results to prove we did something good and it worked. The team then is disbanded. They go back to their jobs and another team comes on. 
you can have more than one team in process depending on how big you are and what your 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 manpower is but each team only has one event and that's what they focus on again for no longer than a month if you can get it done in a week great and the idea is to break those kaizen events into fairly small increments each increment will yield an improvement and you will be able to measure that sure enough my processing time may not have changed but guess what my lead time just changed in that area and my total lead time in that value stream has now shrunk and in some cases simple changes can lead you tremendous benefits and i'm going to kind of tell you a war story here we were working for a plant that made uh, a particular product every product was was custom made to a particular customer and they did everything in groups of of 60 pieces and each of those 60 pieces had to go through five different process steps and they spent three minutes at each process step we put a stopwatch on it and it was incredible okay every station got their work done on that piece in three minutes I mean it was great okay the point is you you roll up a, a cart full of 60 units you do one you put it on the next cart and that cart didn't move until all 60 were on it so the first piece sat there for 59 times three minutes before it moved on and it went to the next station and the same thing happened we made the suggestion that they take their carts with 60 pieces and instead use carts of 30 pieces and they they thought we were nuts but they tried it and what happened was each piece was now moving through the entire production stream in half its lead time and they went from being marginally profitable to very very profitable they were delivering product to customers faster than their competitors were we didn't change a single process step all we changed was the amount of time things sat around and waited and that was measurable in the bottom line in one month's time the finance the chief financial officer was astonished the the president of the company was tickled pink so that just kind of gives you an idea one simple change and it made a tremendous effect on this company okay this concludes my presentation about value stream mapping. And I'm hoping that you got from this, yes, this may work for me. It may be something I wanna look at in more detail or nah, can't do it. Okay. So at that point, uh, I think we're open for questions. We are. And let me see if I can do something about that telephone. Hmm. Jim, are you able to see the chat box? Um, not yet. Okay. I can read to you the question that's in the chat box if that'll help. Um, I've got some symbols across the top. Um, is it the uh, balloon with three dots in it? Uh, probably. Okay, got it. Okay. okay. Um, Thomas Henderson. Yes. Okay, and and uh, Thomas, the question your question is if I can, I'm just going to restate it. In a future state value stream map, a push system would be most likely result in product buildup at some point. Um, if it does, you've done something wrong. Okay. Um, and this is where tack time sort of comes in. If if you uh, if you implement a Kaizen event at one particular point in your value stream and tremendously improve it and don't improve other places in the stream, all you may be doing is moving a bottleneck. Okay, and bottling things up. Uh, as, as an example, uh, consider uh, if you're familiar with a crew team, uh, an eight or crew team, eight guys all rowing in unison, all rowing at the same pace and they get to where they're going, all right? Now, if I have one of those eight who can actually row twice as fast, and if I let him row twice as fast, all I'm doing is introducing chaos. I'm not going to get to where I'm going because he's out of sync with everybody else. 
and your value stream, every operation in your value stream, this is where tack time comes in, must be in sync with all the others. You may discover in the course of doing your value stream map that you have what's called a pacemaker event. This is something that every part of this product goes, it, it has to go through this, and it's, it's not necessarily a bottleneck, but the speed in which that pacemaker event works determines what goes out the back door. And there's no point in making the upstream activities any faster. All you're gonna do is put a bottleneck in front of your pacemaker. You've got a couple of options. You can improve the pacemaker somehow if you can do that, or not doing that, you're going to have to look at the upstream operations and say, what's the point in making more than my pacemaker can handle? Maybe I take those other activities and reduce them so that they match the pacemaker, so that their tack time is the same as the pacemakers, and it goes out the, the back door. Now, have I made more product? No. Have I used less resources? Yes, because I'm not making wasted product. I'm not making stuff ahead of time. I'm making only as it's needed. So um, the issue, in, in, in again, in the, uh, in the value stream is identify your pacemaker and he's, unless you can change how fast he works, okay, he, everybody else might as well work to his speed because work any faster isn't going to help a bit. Um, okay, Carolyn, okay. Actually, I think uh, H Henderson had another follow-up question yes. to that that came before Carolyn. Okay. Um, yes, yes it is. Uh, uh, your question is, you're defining value added as a step that transformed the product? Typically, yes. Yes. Uh, you, you're changing form, fit, and function. You're adding a piece to it. Uh, in some cases, you have to perform. It, it may be, whether you like it or not, it's a QC step. You're, you're, you're measuring to prove that you've done everything right so far. But yes, basically, that's it. And then Carolyn. Um, okay. Won't this, okay. Uh, if moving pieces faster, uh, decreases the lead time. Wouldn't this increase the amount of production time? Um, I'm not sure I understand exactly what you mean by, excuse me, by transportation time. Um, basically, uh, because pieces moved in sets of 50, of 60, okay, that at each of the five work centers, okay, a particular piece sat there uh, either in front of the work center or behind the work center, okay, for 60 times three minutes. Okay, that's 180 minutes in front, 180 minutes in back. By cutting that wait time in half, the entire cart of 30 pieces, yes, it's a smaller cart, okay, but it moved to the next work center and those 30 pieces were being worked on while another set was being worked on at the previous work center. Uh, we did not increase our transportation time because the, uh, the uh, work centers were relatively close to each other. The space between the work center was basically the space to put a 60 unit card in there. Uh, so, and we, we kept them all timed so that they worked in sync. Uh, again, the, the, the time working on each piece didn't change, but the time each piece sat waiting to be worked on or waiting after it had been worked on uh, was decreased by half. And then your next question is, wouldn't you have to move the cart twice as many times? Uh, that move time was, uh, for lack of a better term, really not significant. Again, the cart was simply pushed to the next work center, which was probably not more than, than 10 or 20 feet away. Um, and then, Okay, thank you. Caroline, I guess I answered your question. Uh, Thomas Henderson, again, at what level in the org chart should people have involvement in the mapping process? Oh, cool, yeah, okay. Um, we develop, we put together, as a consultant now, I'm talking as a consultant, uh, we don't like to come in and do a value stream map without having a 
an in-house team working with us. And typically what we do, we, we put together uh, uh, workers from the shop floor, first line supervisors, and that's that's pretty much it. You don't want to go too much higher up on the uh, uh, on the chain of command because they get torn away from your, your mapping process real easy. Uh, we, we give the team about a half a day or a day's worth of uh, instruction in lean techniques and in how to do a value stream map. And then we turn them loose. And if it's a big operation, we may put groups of people in, in different sections. We've identified what the process stream is and we say, okay, go out and talk to these people. This is the kind of information I want collected. Okay. Uh, get their input and, you know, for, talk to the forklift drivers, talk to the machine operators. Okay. Talk to the maintenance people. Okay. And bring back the information. And then we start putting our map together. And that's how we can get things done in relatively, again, three, if it takes a week, that's unusually large, uh, long time for a, a value stream map. But uh, in a week or less, we now have the map done and it is surprisingly accurate. Occasionally we'll put, if, if they're not sure, if the, if the man they're talking to on the shop floor doesn't have a real good uh, answer for them, they may sit there and put a stopwatch on it and find out, okay? But otherwise, you get your answers in a week's time. So this is done typically with people uh, who daily work with the process. Uh, QC people, by the way, are, are uh, really a lot of fun to put on these, uh, these mapping teams because they, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, they know where all the skeletons are hidden, okay, and they can bring that out in case an operator forgets, they'll, they'll point out something. Uh, so, like I say, uh, quality people are fun. And the next question deals with health care. Doctors providing a consulting service, and a couple of weeks later, the rest of the care team provide the actual care service to clients. In this case, how can we draw lead and process times if we agree that cons the consult is a service as a result of the process? And I'm not quite sure I understand what you're talking about. Um, let me kind of take a, a, a back step here just a minute. Hopefully this will answer your question. Um, look at the value stream. What value stream are you looking at? What does it include? Does it include the consulting service and then the care that comes from that? Okay. And if it does, then you want to map the entire process. Um, typically, you see value stream maps used on the production floor. But in fact, uh, I have had really good success dealing with uh, paperwork flow or dealing with uh, planning operations, planning production. Uh, and uh, it's, it's the same thing. Uh, paperwork is your product and it has to go through various stages. And how can we make those stages uh, that lead time in the paperwork process uh, be reduced significantly? Um, so I'm not sure if I answered your question. If needs be, you can contact me after this and we can talk further about this. Uh, Thomas Henderson, we have a lot of questions today. Do you find it hard to have management part of the team finding fault in the person and not the system. Um, I have not had that issue simply because um, when management looks at a value stream map and they see what's going on, and uh, what's really interesting is that management usually has something in their own mind that says, oh, this is how we operate. Okay, and they'll tell me as a consultant, oh yeah, we do this, this, and this. You walk out to the shop floor, and it could be a, a, a world of difference between what, what management thinks goes on and what actually goes on out there. And at, occasionally, you'll find a manager and say, well, that's not what we do. We do this other thing. And generally, somebody in the team sits up and says, sorry, boss, that's not true. Okay, and uh, once uh, you're not trying to, to pin the blame on anybody, you're looking at a systemic problem and how you can fix it. And you, I have to remind managers too, okay, the guy on the production floor is trying to do his very best given the fact that he cannot choose the machinery he wants, he cannot choose his raw materials, he cannot choose his engineering drawings or how he makes the product. 
He follows all of the things that have been set up by somebody else and has to make, in some cases, a silk purse out of a sow's ear. Okay, that's not his fault that it doesn't come out right half the time. It's the fault of who told him this is how you have to do it. And, you know, that when management begins to realize that, and that's sometimes that's what a, a consultant has to do is just take him into a corner and say, you guys have given him the wrong instructions, the wrong raw materials, and the wrong equipment. How do you expect me to make it right? So hopefully we get around that. And so far, I have not seen a, a situation where management uh, tries to put the blame on the workers and, and not, not the system. Generally, they all they want to do is see results. Okay, we're about finished here. Any more questions? Yeah, I'm not. I'm looking in the chat box. I'm not seeing any other questions, but just in case somebody is uh, frantically typing one, I'll take another moment here to remind everyone that our next uh, webinar will be on Wednesday, September the 27th, uh, which will be Effective Networking with Michael Hughes. Uh, so hopefully many of you who are online today will be joining us for that one. It looks like many of the same folks have registered in advance for that one. We're, we're glad to see that. Uh, Looking here to see if there's any more questions in the chat box. Looks like we're rapidly approaching the top of the hour here, Jim. So I doubt if too many more people will have questions. Uh, the PDF that you're going to be sharing, does that have your contact information in it? Yes, it'll have that that the basic slide. You can people can uh, can uh, contact me. Again, you can go to the Cogent website, uh, cogentmr.com, and uh, you can you can contact me through that or uh, again the telephone or uh, email by all means uh, at the last session I had uh, I got a number of questions two and three days later that uh, uh, involved a lot of interaction so by all means uh, pose your questions to me give me some of your ideas and and be more than happy to talk about it great okay well it looks like uh, we don't have any further questions we have a couple of comments uh, one was a uh, very effective use of time presenting a complex subject. And as you mentioned before, uh, this is a very uh, complex subject uh, to talk about. And really be yes. able to you really be able to fit it into like 45 minutes to an hour. So uh, yeah, you should, if I was training a team, this would be a half a day. <laughs> okay. Well, it looks like we have no further questions, so we're going to go ahead and sign off. Uh, we'd like to thank, uh, thank you, Jim, for having, uh, for giving this talk today. And we'd also like to thank everybody else uh, for tuning in and participating. And uh, with that, uh, we'll wish everybody a good rest of the day and hopefully see some of you uh, on the 27th. Until then, uh, thanks and uh, take care. Bye now. Good. Thank you for the opportunity.